Coming up on Network Africa. The Zimbabwean government announces that former president Robert Mugabe has been in hospital since April. Machete wielding men attack a coastal area of Kenya overnight in what is believed to be a turf war between rival gangs. Plus, jihadist groups reportedly opened more than 600 schools on the border of Mali and Burkina Faso. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Tenny Ola Shoboale. Zimbabwe's former leader, Robert Mugabe, has been in hospital in Singapore since April. His successor, President Emerson Mnangagwa, says the 95-year-old founding father of the nation has been receiving treatment for an undisclosed illness and is responding well. The president had announced in November that Mr. Mugabe was unable to walk due to ill health and old age. Zimbabwe's public health services have practically collapsed and those who can afford it seek treatment in South Africa or other foreign countries. Mr. Mugabe, during his time in power, sought almost all his medical care in Singapore. Now, relatives of people murdered under the regime of the Gambia's former ruler, Yaya Jame, have expressed outrage over the release of three self-confessed assassins. The men, who were members of a paramilitary unit known as the Junglers, were freed from army custody two weeks after appearing before the Gambian Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. The three soldiers, Malik Jata, Omar Jalo, and Amadou Baji, have been under detention since the arrest by the military police in 2017, when President Adama Barrow took office after winning elections in December 2016. His government set up the TRRC, which is investigating human rights violations alleged to have been committed during Mr. Jamey's 22-year rule, including reports of extrajudicial killings, torture, and arbitrary detention. Justice Minister Abubakar Tambadu has defended the decision to release the three men, saying it would encourage other human rights violators to testify. Meanwhile, the Gambia has released new currency notes with national birds replacing portraits of former president Yaya Jameh. Central Bank Chief Bakri Jame presented copies of the new notes to President Adama Barrow ahead of the release through commercial banks. The Gambia uses the Dalasi, which has been in circulation since independence in 1965. The current notes are a total overhaul of the denominations that include 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 and 200. Ugandan lawmaker and musician Bobby Wine has been charged with intending to annoy, alarm or ridicule the president. The new charge is in addition to a previous charge of treason. In an alleged incident that led to his arrest, the MP and his colleagues are accused of throwing stones at the presidential convoy during an election rally in the northern town of Arua in 2018. If convicted, Wine faces up to life in prison. Wine, whose real name is Robert Kiagulani, is still facing charges in another court for staging a protest against a law that imposed a tax on mobile money transactions and use of social media in 2018. The musician turned MP who has become an opposition force against President Yoweri Museveni's three-decade rule recently announced that he will stand for president in the 2021 election. Still in East Africa, at least eight people have been seriously injured after machete-wielding men attacked a coastal area of Kenya overnight in what is believed to be a turf war between rival gangs. Witnesses in Bamburi district say the group, made up of at least 30 young men armed with machetes, knives and other crude weapons, began slashing at anyone in sight. The injured have been rushed to a local clinic before being transferred to Coast General Hospital in the city of Mombasa for further treatment. Let's get more on this story from Kenyan journalist Cyprus Mbati. Thank you for joining us on the program. So what more can you tell us about the suspected gang attack in the uh, Bamburi district? 
Uh, good evening. Uh, as I can tell you now for now, the police operation is still ongoing in the, in the coast, in the area, where, where, where the said gang attacked locals and indiscriminately injuring at least 15 people, of which four are serious, in serious condition in hospital. Uh, police operations are ongoing there, and you know it's a, it's a densely populated area. We expect more and more arrests, but police say they have arrested three suspects who are behind the attack, but we're just waiting to hear the next move. So, speaking about the police, how are, the, are they responding to this violence? A special force team was sent to the area last night. Uh, up to now, they are still operating in the area. Uh, they say they have three prime suspects in connection to the attack. And uh, police say they have realized that the, the suspects behind the attack had actually taken uh, drugs or alcohol, which uh, they, they, they cite as the cause of the, of, the, of the violence that was meted on the locals. But then they understand that uh, Mombasa now is facing a crisis in terms of employment because uh, the Kenya Post Authority is now kind of changing the models of brandy in the area. So this is affecting the entire area in terms of... Uh, jobs distribution in the area so we expect more violence to to, to be occurring occurring and occurring in the area uh, and uh, police have vowed to ensure there is more deployment of police officers in the, in the area to deal with the menace now that may, may lead to more arrests or deaths we cyprus we also understand that the government had actually issued an ultimatum three years ago to the gang members to surrender why is it so difficult for the police to clamp down on the group if they've been causing a lot of issues on the district for so long? The, the, gang, behind, the gang behind the attack is called uh, Wakali Wao, and uh, it's not a new gang. It's, it's, it's a, an emerging gang that has been uh, operating in the area. And this, uh, it's a group of youngsters who actually usually meet in the name of uh, trying to organize how they can make their living. And then you find that in the, in the process they consume drugs. The drug, uh, drug abuse is actually rampant, is rampant in the area. So in the process that you find them, they become violent, they need to get money. So the only way they can get money is by stealing mobile phones from the, the public, which they sell in the, in the end and uh, use the same to get money for their drugs. So it's, it's a circus. Uh, we hope that even the government will be able to tame the, the, the circus because it's going to affect the tourism in the, in the region. I remember Mombasa itself relies on tourism, so if this violence continues to happen, it may scare away those tourists who are going to visit the area. And um, at least eight people were seriously injured in this attack. Who will bear the cost of the medical treatment? Uh, those injured will now have to bear their own costs. There's nothing that can, that can, that can happen and unless the county government now decides to, to, to cater for their cost of the of uh, medication, as it turns now, they are the ones. They are the only ones who are paying their own bills. That's what happens usually, unfortunately. But then uh, we have seen a big response to the area. Um, we expect more casualties from the so-called uh, gang members, and I believe uh, the, the, the the kind of violence that was met in the area is going to cause more uproar and uh, concern from the authorities now to to kind of react to there with a lot of force. It's a matter of time. Thank you, sir. Kenyan journalist Cyprus Mbachi speaking to us there from Nairobi. Moving on now, reports say jihadist group have opened more than 600 schools on the border of Mali and Burkina Faso. A Malian radio station studio to Mali says that Mali's most powerful and violent jihadist group, JNIM, is one of those opening schools. JNIM has carried out frequent attacks in Mali and neighboring Burkina Faso. The two countries continue to experience frequent attacks by Islamist militants. France, the former colonial New power has thousands of troops in the region and from 2013 started pushing back the jihadist who sees swathes of territory. Security expert Chidi Nwaunu joins us live now on the program to tell us more about this. Chidi, thank you for joining us on Network Africa. Thanks for having me. So what do you make of this report that JNIM jihadists have opened over 600 schools in Mali and Burkina Faso? Well, it's an interesting uh, development, but you have to look at it, um, you know, with a certain criticism. When they say schools, you know, what kind of schools are we talking about? We're talking about schools providing a full curriculum with standard education, English languages, sciences. Are we talking about Islamic schools giving out their version of Islam? Are we talking about places that they call where
where they're, you know, they're selecting children. So a lot more detail needs to be understood about this report. What the most important takeaway is that you've essentially got undercovered spaces where these uh, organizations can go in and, you know, set out their own kind of infrastructure without interference from the government. Well, Chidi, if this report is true, does it mean that these countries have become a failed states if the jihadists could operate so freely in there? Well, if they're not failed states, they're very close to being failed states. You know, once the government no longer has control of its territory, no longer can, can provide for its citizens, then it, you know, it is close to being a failed state. So the, the, the key question again is, you know, what is the government of Mali's response to this? Is it able to provide these services to other citizens who are not within these areas? And even if, if it's not providing them outside of the troubled areas, then that shows that it's got a lot more problems than just, you know, the jihadist groups. Yeah, we also have to remember that France also has thousands of troops stationed in the area to fight the jihadists, but it seems their effect is quite minimal. Why is this so? Well, the, the problem is the troops can't be everywhere, you know, all the time. So, and particularly with France and their colonial history, they've got to be very wary of, you know, assuming a full kind of uh, military occupation of, of Mali. So, of Bahrain, you know, that's uh, based there, and the, the G5 to help you. They, they will go on, on specific operations, they will defend their bases, they will patrol around their bases, but they can't be everywhere all the time. That, that's the job of the Malian army or the Malian police. So whilst France might be there with the presence, it still needs, you know, the Malians to fill that gap and, you know, provide a security bubble for their own people. And today, I think the main question is, how can the threat from JNIM and other Islamists operating in the region be tackled? Uh, again, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's two key components. There's the security elements where you need, you know, robust and professional and disciplined security forces, but you need, the, you know, governance and basic development. You need to have roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, things that people need so there's no inclination to be sympathetic to these groups. And also you need law courts and police so that if there are disputes, if there are conflicts, uh, people can find a resolution without, you know, resorting to either mob uh, justice or jungle justice or revenge attacks. So it's all coming down essentially to governance. If, if, even if these uh, countries, places like Mali, which are huge countries with large open spaces, even if they can't govern everywhere, you know, if they show that they're governing well in certain places, it has a multiplier effect on the other parts and it, it reduces the, the appeal of these groups. All right, then security expert Chidin Wanu, thank you for sharing your thoughts and analysis with us on Network Africa. Now, the United Nations mission in South Sudan is continuing with its efforts to sustain peace in the country. That's why a peacekeeping patrol led by the force commander visited communities in Yaytown to hear first-hand stories about the threats residents face and to better understand what the mission can do to help deter violence. The convoy of peacekeepers head out of the United Nations compound early in the morning on their way south from Juba towards the troubled town of Ye. The 155-kilometer journey is a challenge during the rainy season, given the impact of heavy downpours on the mud-packed roads. Engineers have significantly upgraded the main supply route to ensure people and goods can travel safely between the agricultural land of central Equatoris and communities in need. Of more concern is a recent surge in ambushes and the killing of civilian commuters by armed groups. The local governor describes the attacks as barbaric, calling for an end to the violence. Lending heed to the call of peace, particularly protection of the civilian population. You cannot target a civilian who is very vulnerable, somebody who goes about his or her life just to earn a living to a market and you target these civilians. And I think this is the most lowest an organization can do, which is to, to, to us, this is an act of cowardice. Because if it's a movement that has an objective, we will not target the civilian. However, we have agreed in the meeting with the, the union is that all of us will have to work collectively again to restore hope so that the civilian feel safe and they do about their business alongside the roads and the major towns and our villages in the state. Over a period of time, we hope that uh, we are able to build a security environment that encourages people to come back to this beautiful land and get on with their regular work. And, of course, 
building their lives once again. The local commissioner estimates that 7,000 refugees have recently returned from neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Many have come home to find their farms and tukuls looted or destroyed and are being forced to live with relatives or to rely on humanitarian aid for survival. Still to come on the program. Libyan forces loyal to rebel leader General Khalifa Haftar launch airstrikes against an airbase in Misrata. That's in a moment.